Now, hear the good news and be not afraid. Good morning. Welcome to Be Not Afraid, Iowa Catholic Radio. Father Piché, good morning. Good morning, Father. We have had a beautiful uh, week with the Sacred Heart of Jesus, but previously we have today and a very interesting saints and martyrs as well. St. John Fisher and Thomas More. Let us begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, who in martyrdom have brought true faith to its highest expression, graciously grant that, strengthening through the intercession of Saints John Fisher and Thomas More. We may confirm by the witness of our life the faith we process with our lips. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Thomas More. You know, St. Thomas More is uh, very near and dear to the hearts of many people here in central Iowa because of uh, the the St. Thomas More Center, CYC, where many of our kids are out at camp, right, as we speak. You know, you and I uh, both have gone out to help with confessions and masses up there during the summer. I have many very fond memories of camp as a kid, um, and I and, and it's uh, been a really important um, source of vocation for many of our, 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 our young men, our seminarians often work out there, but also many of the young women that have entered religious life from the area uh, have had important experiences at camp. You mentioned uh, very good memories. Mm -hmm. Could you please share with us one? Yeah, no, I, um, I, I, I remember um, I, camp looked a lot different 30 years ago than it does now. <laughs> but um, I, I remember having a profound experience of, of the mass at about 10 years old. Um, uh, it, it was... It, a chapel that was outside like on a picnic table but um but the the care and the seriousness with seriousness with which the priest took it um uh made very clear that what happens on sunday happens in all kinds of places and sort of the, the cosmic character that was important and there are friendships that i that i developed at camp that i still have now as a, a grown-up and a priest so um it's a good thing i'm great grateful. it's very important in different dioceses around the world, in, obviously in our diocese, that we have a special place for our youth, you know, to not, all, I mean, to be fun, but at the same time to receive God's presence through the Holy Eucharist and also catechesis and faith formation. I think the insight of uh, Father DiCarlo and his, his predecessor and Bishop Dingman, um, you know, they, they, they drew on St. Thomas More, who's called the man for all seasons, and to use that as a, a sort of a byline for us here. Because in Iowa, in a, in a kind of uh, particular way, maybe not unique, but particular, we get all four seasons and we get them in force. Right. right. You don't have mild winters or mild summers or even mild springs and falls. And so, um, but if you can learn to see God in all of those, then you can learn to see God in the sort of seasons of life, which is why Moore was able to see God when he was the most powerful man in the country and was able to see God when he was putting his head on the chopping block. That is uh, very interesting. Anything else relate to John Fisher? Yeah, so St. John Fisher is probably less well known to, to, to our listeners. So John Fisher and Thomas More's um, festivals are celebrated together, and it's because they were both mur martyred during this kind of two, three week period um, in England. John Fisher was the, the, the recusant bishop. He was the last bishop that stayed faithful to Rome when all of the other bishops had gone what today we would call Anglican. Um, and, uh, and the Pope was so angry about the way uh, that the king was treating this bishop of his um, who was not really, yeah, I don't know, it would be like being the Bishop of Wichita or something. Like he wasn't very important. The diocese wasn't very important, any of that. The Pope made him a cardinal. So the kind of thing that, uh, that, that Pope Francis is doing now where he deliberately picks out bishops from kind of insignificant diocese to poke <laughs> at the other bishops, this is a real old thing because this is happening 500 <laughs> years ago. Um, and uh, the, there's, a, there's a terrific scene. I, I would recommend uh, listeners just YouTube John Fisher execution scene. It's from a series that otherwise was pretty deeply problematic, but they get this bit exactly right. And it's drawn right from the, the, the accounts of his death. Um, he, Fisher's been in prison for a year, like more. Um, the, when the Pope decides to make him a cardinal, that just incenses uh, the king to have him executed. Um, and he, he comes out and he says, he's wearing this dingy old undershirt that he's been wearing for a year. And he says, uh, um, as you can see, I came dressed for my wedding day. Wow. Uh, and then he says, you know, but I'm scared. I can't do this without your help. And so the people who are there to witness the execution. Now, these people are all now theoretically have gone Protestant, right? But they all, they all start calling spontaneously, God save Cardinal Fisher. God bless Cardinal Fisher. Wow. And, and they pray him 
while his head is being cut off. Like they pray is they pray him to his death, which is as best we can tell exactly how he died. It called my attention the word wedding. This uh -huh. is my wedding day. And obviously it's more transcendental perception that we have about the wedding, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, you and I are doing lots of weddings because it's wedding season. Right. To a Saturday, sometimes during the week. I've got four this week. Um, I don't think most of our brides are especially anticipating martyrdom. Um, <laughs> but, of course, that's exactly what this is for. You know, uh, the, the Eastern churches crown the bride and the groom. And the reason for the use of the crowns isn't because they're a king and a king, a king and a queen. It's because they're martyrs. It's the crown of martyrdom. And, you, and, and, and you're really martyred each day by your spouse in preparation for the life of heaven. And obviously that covenant, you know, God is included in this union, not in a simple uh, human being desire, intentions. It's more than that. It's well, the, a divine commitment. The reason the collect uh, says that, that, that um, martyrdom brings the faith to its highest expression is because in the blood of the martyrs, the Christian most perfectly uh, conforms himself or herself to Christ. Their blood is shared with his. Um, maybe not on the cross, maybe on the chopping block or, or in front of the execution squad. But in some ways, it means that the heart of the martyr is most closely conformed to the sacred heart because it's willing to have itself poured out for the sake of the world. It's beautiful how describe also the rings, the role of the rings into the wedding, in, into the matrimony right as well. You know, once upon a time, um, the, the, once upon a time, the rings were not given till the end of the ceremony. And the reason for it was the rings were laid on the corporal next to the host, which would be consecrated at the mass. There wasn't actually a separate blessing for the rings. We had to kind of make one up relatively recently. They were sort of um, consecrated by proximity. And so, so they were sacramentals in a very, very strong sense. And the idea was that this ring was a constant reminder. You were consecrated just like the elements at mass. You were set apart. You were sort of jesus in order to be able to die. Beautiful. Iowa Catholic Radio, be not afraid. Hello, this is Steve Ray. Join me in Iowa Catholic Radio on a journey of a lifetime with a Footprints of God pilgrimage to the Holy Land, November 11th through the 20th, 2023. We'll visit the places where our Lord performed miracles, including the Mount of Transfiguration, the Wedding Church in Cana, Tabga, where Jesus multiplied the loaves and fish, and of course, the Holy Sepulcher. The scriptures will come alive as I offer expert teaching along the way like I always do. Visit iowacatholicradio.com for all the details. Everyday Iowa Catholic Radio connects listeners to Christ with the help of business underwriters. Our listeners appreciate and support businesses who share their values and beliefs. If you own or manage a business, we would like to talk with you about how we can work together to make a positive impact in Central Iowa and beyond. Iowa Catholic Radio underwriters share with us in the mission of changing lives through the good news of Jesus Christ. To learn more about how your business can support Iowa Catholic Radio, contact Deacon Mark Campbell at 515-223-1150. 515-223-1150. Faith Check with Greg Yule on the Iowa Catholic Radio Network. On this Faith Check, let's take a look at God's plan for marriage. The Pharisees asked Jesus if he thought it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife, and Jesus responded by pointing them back to God's original plan. From the beginning, God made them male and female, Jesus explained. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no one must separate. Jesus said Moses had allowed divorce because the Israelites' hearts had grown hardened. But Jesus came to restore what had been lost in the fall, to make us new creations with new hearts who live by the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Catholic marriages should not look like secular marriages. They are sacramental, which means that our marriages are to be the instruments that God uses to help us grow in holiness. Those who truly put Christ in the sacraments at the center of their marriage will find that in spite of marriage's challenges, their love for one another will grow and help lead them to closer union with God. This is Greg Yule for Faith Check. At Intervisions Healthcare, we see patients with unplanned pregnancies from ages 12 to 43. An unplanned pregnancy is traumatic at any age. For that reason, we specialize in educating, encouraging, and empowering vulnerable and at-risk mothers facing an unexpected pregnancy with the medical information and services necessary for them to make an informed decision. For more information on the free medical services at Intervisions Healthcare or to support our mission or become a volunteer, visit IVHcare.org. Welcome back to Be Not Afraid, Iowa Catholic Radio. 
as I mentioned in the segment before, Father, so this is the week also to the Sacred Heart of, of Jesus. And talking about these martyrs, sacrifices, uh, promises, and divine commitment, may I use that expression, we have in a beautiful collect prayer from the solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, this word that probably moving us to reflect more deeply. God, who in the heart of your Son, wounded by our sins, bestowed on us in mercy the boundless treasures of your love, grant, we pray, that in paying him the homage of our devotion, we may also offer worthy reparation. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So what I think is so important about this prayer, I think a lot of people have a sort of vague sense of the sacred heart. If you're churchy, you know, something like First Fridays are a thing. Maybe you're aware there's a litany or something like this. But I, I think what kind of gets missed or misunderstood about this a lot that is so very important is that so the, sa so the, the, the uh, devotion of the sacred heart is not devotion to an organ. Right. Right. So it's not an accident that we have devotion to the sacred heart and not devotion to the sacred kidney. <laughs> it's it, it is rather heart in the kind of poetical sense. Right. In the way that we use heart to, to, as a sort of um, shorthand for emotions, passions, seat of sort of human identity, all that kind of stuff. Right. Heart's what we mean when we tell a kid going out onto the ball field, you got to play with heart, son. You, you got to give it all your heart. Right. So so heart here. And, 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 and the church is very clear, even in, in its dogmatic statements concerning the sacred heart. This is devotion to the human heart of God. Wow. That in the God, man, Christ Jesus, everything that is authentically human really is present. He's not, he's not really God and play acting as a man. He's not really a man and play acting or tagging along or co-opting divine authority. He's really both. And that as such, the sacred heart is the human heart of Jesus Christ, who is the second person of the Blessed Trinity, so that God has a heart. God, in his godness, God sort of at the remove, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit don't have emotions in the way that you and I have emotions. Right. They don't suffer passions. The, the, the topic of divine impassibility or like God's unchangingness. Um, is is absolutely essential to understand before we can get the impact of the incarnation. Because in the incarnation, God subjects himself, and that, that verb is important, he both becomes subject to and becomes a subject in a way that previously he wasn't really, right? He becomes um, subject to human passions. But unlike us, he has so perfectly mastered his passions. His passions are so perfectly aligned. They don't ever get him into trouble, right? Like I came into the office late this morning because I had sausage somebody made for me that looked and smelled real good. And I thought it would be tasty and it upset my stomach. But, but my stomach was only competent to be upset because the sausage itself seemed attractive. The Lord Jesus certainly had the capacity to have favorite foods. I'm not saying he didn't like his mother's hummus or pita bread or something, right? But but, um, but he wasn't subject to them in the same way you and I are. He wasn't even passive to his own passions. The word passion, which is the, the old word for emotion, you can see it in the word emotion, right? Because motion's built in there. Passion's the same thing. Um, it's where we get the word passive from. We're passive to our emotions. Our experience of them is passive. Mm -hmm. That's why we fall in love or lose our temper. Jesus was able... To, to, to focus and direct his emotions so perfectly that he actually fulfilled the command to love perfectly the father and his neighbor. That is and a very eloquent uh, description about love. But this is, is, is this human love moving in a high level of comprehension about the divine love. And sometimes we miss that part in the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know? Sometimes when we talk about charity in the abstract, Correct. it can sound very, very robotic, 
or removed automatic right? right automatic so 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 you know i'm to will the good of the other and the union appropriate to our relationship right that's basically saint thomas's definition well willing the good of the other like i can sit here and abstractly will the good of an orphan in ethiopia but if i don't know the orphan in ethiopia it, it is very difficult to recognize this as human love i can love my niece Right? Like, like I can have a human relationship with my niece, but I can't have a human relationship with someone I don't know. And so what the sacred heart allows us to do, this, this is what's so critical about it, is it enables us to love in a way we could not love on our own. What the grace of God does is it so conforms us to the sacred heart of Jesus. It so conforms us to the human heart of God that we can actually love not only sort of the way we were supposed to before our parents messed stuff up, but love like God loves, which is more than we're actually capable of on our own. Also meaning protection, you are in a different stage when you love like God loves you, and you are capable to love God through that reality. And sometimes it's very unrealistic for our uh, simple intellectual interpretation about love. You, you, know? you know, I think people, I, I think we do intuit truths around this, right? We were talking about weddings in the last segment because of uh, Thomas More and John Fisher. Um, uh, you know, the catechism has this startling statement, right? That um, uh, tr authentic fidelity is, un authentic fidelity is impossible without grace. Now, on the face of that, that just seems stupid. We all know atheists that manage to be faithful to their spouses. If, 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 if the mark of fidelity is simply not sleeping with someone you're not supposed to, all kinds of people have made this happen throughout history. But, but if what constitutes fidelity is simply not betraying the person in the worst possible way, then your threshold for real love is so low it hardly matters. When instead, if your threshold is How, can I give myself absolutely wholeheartedly to the other for their good and for the salvation of the world? Oh, that's a different thing. Completely Th different. That's a whole different thing. And that's the kind of fidelity, the kind of authenticity that's only made possible by God's grace. Make unique the sacred heart of Jesus. That's it. Not comparable with a human being. And, and, and on its own, absolutely. And then, of course, in, in the mystery of grace is shared out with us. Which, which is the whole mystery of the Eucharistic exchange, that God shares himself with us so that n not so much that he becomes a part of us, but that we actually become part of him, one with him. Iowa Catholic Radio, be not afraid. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio is provided by CTO. What great news for donors to the Catholic Tuition Organization. You now receive 75% of your donation back in Iowa tax credits. Your support has helped thousands of students attend our Catholic schools. Best gift ever. Online, ctoiowa.org. At CTO, the bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences, where you can chart your course for more. Mercy College provides unparalleled clinical rotations, hands-on learning, accelerated education, and flexible schedules. Since 1899, Mercy College has been transforming students into healthcare professionals. Guided by Catholic values, our faculty put classroom theory into practice. Students are prepared for roles in service and leadership throughout their own careers. Learn more at mchs.edu. Mercy College of Health Sciences. mchs.edu. You're invited to a special event on Eucharistic Miracles, Tuesday evening, June 28th at St. Elizabeth Seton in Carlisle. Franciscan brother Julian Maria of the Knights of the Holy Eucharist will share about the extraordinary benefits of Eucharistic adoration. With a reception to follow, plus a chance to view Iowa Catholic Radio's Eucharistic Miracles of the World banner display. Don't miss this chance to deepen your knowledge of and love for our Eucharistic Lord. That's Tuesday, June 28th at 6 p.m. St. Elizabeth Seton in Carlisle. Hello, this is Steve Rade, inviting you to join me along with Matt Wilcom and Father P.J. McManus for the Iowa Catholic Radio's 15th anniversary pilgrimage to the Holy Land, November 11 through the 20th, 2023. We'll have Mass and dinner on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and visit the upper room where Jesus instituted the Holy Eucharist. Plus, my wife Janet and I will be offering invigorating teaching along the way. Not all pilgrimages are created equal. Brochures and details available at iowacatholicradio.com. Welcome back to Iowa Catholic Radio, Be Not Afraid. If we're talking about the sacred heart of Jesus, 
we must be honoring the Immaculate Heart of Mary as uh -huh. well. That uh -huh. is the, the Saturday immediately after the Friday of the Sacred Heart. So also Mary shows us a tremendous human love to God offering herself as well, you know? That's right. So 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 the Feast of the Immaculate Heart obviously comes after both like on the calendar, but also in history, uh, the, the Feast of the Sacred Heart. And that's important on several levels. I, I think the most important one of which, though, is both of these are tied to Corpus Christi. Um, and that's harder to see now because we typically do Corpus Christi on Sunday. But Corpus Christi very deliberately falls on a Thursday because when was the Holy Eucharist instituted? Holy on Thursday. On a Thursday. And so, so it's and, – and then the traditional date – so – before there were prayers for every weekday of ordinary time, which is a pretty recent thing, um, the priests would celebrate votive masses each day of the week, and the votive mass for Thursday was always the votive mass of the of Christ the High Priest. So, so Thursday is the day peculiarly dedicated to the priesthood and the Holy Eucharist. the The Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart are tied to the Eucharist in this way. Uh, the Sacred Heart is made most perfectly manifest on the altar in the celebration of the Holy Mass. And the Immaculate Heart is sort of the forerunner, the model, the exemplar of what our hearts are to be, right? So so we will never have the human heart of God because none of us are God. And Mary was not God. But she was so perfectly united to God and his humanity that we can actually hope for that. Like that is that is really what we're meant to do and be. And so the tradition of the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart of first Fridays and of first Saturdays, Saturdays is really an attempt to get people to receive Holy Communion more often, true, and also more devoutly, more worthily, more faithfully. We might say today more effectively. Effectively. Um, so, so you can receive communion every day for ages and ages, but if you don't understand what you're doing, if you're not preparing yourself well, if you're not thanking God for the gift, it won't do you any good at all. That's what St. Paul's all about when he says it's going to make you sick. If... You receive communion with real frequency, whether that's daily or weekly or how, however, however often, but with real attention, real devotion, real sincerity, allowing the grace of the sacrament to really transform and convert you, you'll never be the same. You'll grow into the image of, uh, of Christ. So, so, so that's what these feasts are really uh, designed to get us to do, is to live the Christian life more profoundly. And moving from these two amazing celebrations this coming Sunday St. Luke in the chapter 9 verses 51 to 62 describe very interesting invitation to love you know when the days for Jesus is being taken up were fulfilled he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem and he sent messengers ahead of him on the way they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his reception there but they would not welcome him because the destination of his journey was in Jerusalem now, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they journeyed to another village. As they were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens, and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. And to another he said, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. He answered him, Let the dead bury their dead. But you... Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to my family at home. But to him, Jesus said, no one who sets hand to plow and looks to what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So what's going on here, it's so fitting for the Feast of the Sacred Heart, even though the reading comes accidentally from our perspective, is, <laughs> is we have like a litany of people whose hearts are not sacred yet, <laughs> of whose dispositions are not aligned, of whose passions are not focused properly. Um, they're, they're distracted, right? So, so you know, with James and John, the sons of thunder, they're, they are rightfully angry at the way the Lord is being treated, but they overshoot with their anger. So that's the first sign of where most of us go wrong with our emotions, right? We feel like in the right direction, but too much. It's un, unfettered. It's unfocused. Um, uh, th th then we have distractions. Some worthy distractions. Let me go and bury. This is a euphemism for tend to my elderly father. 
I have an elderly father. I know exactly what that's like. <laughs> Can tending to elderly or sick parents get in the way of the preaching of the gospel? Absolutely. I'd probably still be a Dominican if I didn't let it distract me. Is that my sin, right? So, so like this is a real thing. Mm-hmm. This is a very real thing. Um, uh, the, 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 another one, right? Is sort of false piety. I'll, I'll come, Lord, um, but let me. Uh, no, there is no let me. It's not he he won't let us off with excuses, right? No. Or um, justifications. And, 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 and his fundamental move here, right? No one who sets hand to plow and then turns to what was left behind is fit. The kingdom of God requires us to be single-minded and single-hearted. Detached hearted. Like uh, authentically detached, wholly detached. What I love about this passage, right, is Jesus does what most of us are terrified to do pretty much of the time. He corrects people all over the place. He says no five times in the course of this one passage. And, 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 but, he, but he does it in a way that clearly shows love. Sometimes we're afraid because we know we tend to overshoot like James and John. We're afraid to correct it all because we're afraid of being too mean. St. Benedict says the superior shouldn't worry about being too harsh in his corrections unless or until someone corrects him for it. Even if he knows he's done it. He should simply proceed because the correction shows more love for the for the subject rather than the affection or disposition with which he gives it. Man, if if I had a nickel for every time I mess that up, my parish would have a lot of money. <laughs> Likewise, we we can all tend to distraction in this, um, and, and we tell ourselves kind of polite lies, right? Well, I'll wait until uh, they're not ready yet. They can't hear that yet, right? And that's not to say that prudence has no place in the Christian life, but the correction and the, and the willingness to enter into conflict is, is approached in a detached manner, actually the greatest sign of love. This is an, a, a very interesting explanation because sometimes we are very conditional to God. Yeah, we, we, we set conditions on our love in a way that God doesn't. And this is this is really what the sacred heart does that um, that our hearts often fail to. It's why in the in the collect for the feast, right, um, it, it, it draws on the image of so Christ's heart is pierced, right, when his side is is pierced with the lance. And that it's from there that the springs of water flow, a broken heart is most like the Sacred Heart, which is why my favorite image of the Sacred Heart is a bronze that sits out of the retreat house at Griswold. And it's of our Lord celebrating the Eucharist, but the host is his heart. If you want to be like Jesus, if you want your heart to be uh, alike unto his, then you need to be willing to let your hearts be broken. Could you please send us with your blessing, Father? May the Lord grant you hearts always broken with love of him and of his holy people, the Father, the Son. And the Holy Spirit. Iowa Catholic Radio, be not afraid. Be not afraid. Jesus is on the way to encounter you. Be Not Afraid is underwritten by Associated Ophthalmologists. 